Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, I just flew in here a couple days ago from San Francisco, and it's been wonderful so far. Been really enjoying uh, the sights and having a great time. So thanks for having me here. Give you a little overview um, about myself, and uh, I live in San Francisco. I first got started uh, working in technology in uh, 1990. Not working in technology. I'm only 34 years old, but. Uh, I got my first computer in 1990. I came from kind of a standard middle class uh, family. Uh, we had one computer in the household and for some reason uh, I wasn't very popular as a kid so I got on the computer and that was kind of my, my outlet. Um, then in 1996 I discovered the internet, started using the internet and moved to San Francisco. And the reason I moved to San Francisco in 2000 is because the first kind of dot com boom was going on. So a lot of technology companies were just getting off the ground. Um, this was when Amazon.com uh, and a handful of other of the big tech giants were just getting started. And it kind of seemed like the place to be. I didn't know much about San Francisco, but I heard that the Bay Area had a lot of innovation going on and that um, as a computer science student in school, um, I knew that I had to get up there because everything was happening up in the Bay Area. So I actually dropped out of college to pursue uh, working up in, in San Francisco. So um, everything fell apart shortly after I got there, and uh, the, the, the whole crash of uh, the economy around the, the dot-com space went away. And so I eventually landed at uh, Tech TV. And so Tech TV was a television network that was dedicated to teaching people about computers and technology. Um, I started off as a very low-level uh, uh, employee there, so I was doing a lot of the technical kind of behind-the-scenes work, and then eventually, um, started hosting a, a show there called The Screen Savers, so I eventually became one of the, the talent on, on the network, um, which actually I heard was broadcast out here. We had a couple people came up to me and said that they had watched Tech TV out here, which was great. So we, we had syndication all over the world. And then in around 2004, um, you know, I had seen a lot of great people come through Tech TV. So I'd interviewed, you know, Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, and just, uh, uh, gosh, dozens of people come through and I think that I was really inspired by a lot of them. So meeting these great technology giants and seeing what they have created and finding out that they were just normal people like me. And I, I, I got to know, uh, you know, meet these people and, and know them and I realized uh, this is something I can try on my own. Like why not go out there and try my own startup? And so in uh, late 2004, I founded a, a social news website called dig.com. And um, Dig was really kind of the first uh, site that allowed users to vote on content. And um, it would surface the best content on the front page of the site. And this site, this concept was kind of new on the internet at the time. This was before there was like liking on Facebook. So you know, you, you click the like button. Um, and uh, before Twitter and a handful of other things. Um, and this was my first startup and, and it really kind of grew uh, like crazy. I had no idea what I was getting into. So, we grew the company from myself and one other person to somewhere around 70 employees. And um, at our peak, we had around 38 million monthly unique visitors visiting the site. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. Um, uh, basically, I, I stuck with that for about uh, six or seven years. Um, started angel investing around 2006. So I was meeting a lot of other entrepreneurs at the time. Uh, got very lucky and, and got to know the Twitter folks and some of the other uh, companies like Foursquare and Njimoko and Chomp and all these companies and, and was lucky enough to do some investing in the space uh, in the early days. And then um, and in 2011, I decided to start a mobile incubator, so a mobile startup, just because I felt as though uh, now is the right time to be getting into that space just because mobile is exploding. And so why start something new right now? Well, devices like, uh, you know, all these mobile handsets that we have, like the iPhone and Android uh, devices, the prices are continuing to fall. So that's going to continue to happen over some time. Now there are even, uh, you know, I believe the iPhone 3 or, is it 3 or the, yeah, the 3 uh, GS is now free in the United States, so people can get it with a contract. And so everyone is jumping on smartphones. Um, you know, and so mobile is exploding. 180 million iPhones sold. 250 million Android devices being activated. And if you think about how fast this is growing, 50 million new Android devices activated just since November of last year. 
So the, obviously, this, this space is just exploding. Also, why, why mobile is uh, very exciting right now is the barrier to entry is still falling. So the cost to get started and actually launch something new continues to drop. So a single engineer can now do the work of, of many engineers. So for example, if you talk about Windows 95, here, you know, here back when it was launched in 95, it required 300 plus engineers working on this project, three years of development, and they sold a million copies of the software during the first week. Very impressive numbers, but if you take a look at how that compares today, Instagram, which is one of the most popular iPhone apps right now, <clears throat> is now doing, required two engineers to launch this. Just two engineers. 600,000 downloads per week now. And this is, of course, a free application, so it's not making the revenue that Windows is, but there's still another great example is, um, you know, Camera Plus. Camera Plus is another uh, application for the iPhone that has actually paid. Um, it was developed by a friend of mine, Scott. Uh, Scott is 23 years old. He doesn't live in, uh, in the Bay Area or in San Francisco. He's actually in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which doesn't, ver doesn't have a tech scene at all. It's a very small tech scene. Um, but he was able to develop this, gets 20,000 paid applications per day at a $1.99 price point, and now he has a team of four people. So literally, you can do this anywhere. It doesn't have to be in San Francisco or in a tech hub. Uh, you know, as long as you have an idea and you're willing to coordinate getting engineers and other people to work with you, uh, you can start development on an application in any part of the world. So how can you build and scale a service with limited resources? Um, you know, I've, I'm a big fan of kind of bootstrap startups. That is startups that, you know, don't go out and raise a lot of money, but they just do it very scrappy. So they use, you know, their own personal savings or, or, or they can borrow money from fr friends to get things off the ground. When I first launched Dig, um, I was working out of my own personal savings, and it, it, I believe the first prototype uh, ran me around 2,000 uh, US dollars to get that launched in about a month and a half of time. And um, I was able to self-fund that. My, my girlfriend at the time was not too happy because she wanted to use that money as a down payment on a house. Um, but that's OK. It, it worked out. So uh, how can you scale services with limited resources? There are now companies like Heroku uh, and Amazon Web Services. These allow you to actually build and deploy applications rapidly. So Heroku. You know, um, in the past, you would have to have a team of system engineers that would help you set up the servers, that would help you scale the servers. Um, Heroku outsources all of this. So all you have to do is get a software engineer to hook into their APIs, and they will handle the rest of the backend scaling and system administration, software patches, things of this nature. So these are ways that you really don't have to employ additional people at your own company. You can just pass this off to third parties. Also, Amazon EC2 and S3, these are examples of, of, of great services that we use at Milk that allows you to instantly deploy new servers. So, you know, at Dig, we had several hundred computer servers, and we would actually have to go out, purchase these machines, you know, get them in the warehouse, install all the software, rack them and put them in the server racks ourselves. It was just a very uh, labor-intensive process. And so for us to have to, to be able to get around that now and instantly deploy on-demand scaling is, is actually very helpful. Um, it allows you to also, um, you know, if you receive a huge new influx of traffic, so if a lot of people start coming and using your service, it's just a matter of minutes to launch new servers and instances. So it's been very, very, very helpful for us. Also, hiring freelance developers. Um, when I was first getting Dig off the ground, uh, you know, I had studied computer science in school, but it had been a few years since I'd actually coded. So I decided to hire a developer to help code the site for me. Uh, it was just faster. I could have gone back and gone back to school or, or I most likely would have just brushed up on my coding experience and gone down and picked up some books on, on PHP or Python or something. But that would have taken me too long. And so I actually went online and sourced a developer, found a software engineer that was willing to work as a contractor, and then you know, paid them an hourly rate and had them code the initial version of Dig. So, that actually saved me um, a lot of time. So fast forward to today, talk briefly about Milk. Milk is um, our software development company in San Francisco that we launched here just about eight months ago. 
And the idea was to build a small team. So I now have a team of seven people working on this project uh, and build two to three ideas per year. So go after big ideas, try big, bold, new things, and see what sticks. Our first idea and application is called Oink. And Oink is an uh, iPhone app. And the reason that we built Oink is that we wanted to build a platform that would allow you to rank, compare, and share the things that you discover throughout the day and not the places. So in the past, there's been a lot of applications out there. Here's an example of, of Google uh, using their places data. And this is a place that I like to visit in San Francisco called Samovar Tea Lounge. It's a great place if you ever make it to the city. They have great tea. Um, but Samovar, Google is very good at saying, this is Samovar, this is the number of ratings that it has on it, but it doesn't really tell you anything about what's on the inside. So I feel like that's a whole other level of data, data that isn't yet exposed to the consumer. You have no idea what you're about to experience once you go inside of that place. Sometimes there are review sites out there that talk about, you know, they give reviews of what the different types of courses or meals or things like that are inside, but you have to read very long, lengthy reviews to actually get at what's good. So we wanted to focus, here's an example of, of Yelp, and they have very long reviews. So we wanted to focus on answering a few questions. <coughs> Excuse me. What is the best thing here? What is the best thing at that location? What have my friends tried here, and what have they liked or disliked? So if I walk into a place, and even if I'm not with a friend, I'll be able to know if I have other tea friends, if they've enjoyed something there, and it might help encourage me to try something that I may not have already tried. And where can I find the best, and then just kind of fill in the blank. So where can I find uh, the best coffee, the best tea, the best pizza, you name it. And so this is a, a screenshot of our application, and here you see this is how we like to view Sam of our tea lounge. So it shows you very clearly what the most popular item is there. So that's the first placed item is the Essentia tea there. Then the egg bowl is number two. The chai tea is number three. And you can instantly see when you walk into that place um, what you should be trying. Also, we give you a way to rate the things once you're there. So you can say that you love something by giving it a heart. You can say that you like it by giving it a thumbs up. A kind of a sideways th thumb is you're not so sure whether you like it or not, and then you can give it a thumb down if you don't like it at all. So giving you the power to rate and rank and say that I, this is how I feel about this object. Um, also, we show you which, what your friends have thought of that, whether they've liked it or loved it or what they think of that particular item. And then we give you the ability to see how that ranks inside of a place. So that is number 17 at Samovar. Or it's also ranked number 10 in T. So that's not just inside of Samovar, but that's in all of San Francisco. So it allows you to see what is the best tea in San Francisco, just that one item, and how does it compare against all other teas in San Francisco. So that's something that we think is pretty unique. So here you can see as an example of the tea tag. It's sorted, it's kind of hard to see on the display there, but that little dot that you see is that it's sorted within five miles. So those are the best teas within five miles. This is the best chocolate within five miles. And that allows you to make buying decisions. So when you use the application, you can say, well, should I go over here and try this chai latte, which is ranked number 50, and 50 is kind of pretty far down the list, or should I go down the other street and have this chai latte, which is ranked number 15? And most likely, you'll walk the other direction to try this one because it's more people have said that this is something of quality that you should be trying out. Um, people are ranking all different types of things with the application. So right now, uh, you know, this is an example of roller coasters of all things. So at amusement parks, people go in and say, what are my favorite things at Disneyland or you name it, and it allows you to quickly see what they should be trying out. Um, they're ranking where they like to sit, so balcony seating. Um, this is an example of something that's ranked really bad. Someone said, I don't like the flies in this restaurant, so they took a picture of a fly on the wall. It's pretty funny. I had no idea that this was actually going to happen, but it's, it's cool to see the original content that people are putting in there. So Oink, uh, here's where it stands today. Um, we've been out for about four and a half months or so now. We have 200,000 downloads. We're very um, happy and, and honored that Apple gave us the Best in Travel Award for 2011. But the funny thing about this is that we might fail with this application. It's still too early to tell. And that's something that I think that we really embrace. We're, we're okay with that. We're okay with failing 
because we want to try big new things and, and we want to see what will happen. So some of the things that, that we believe in uh, from a philosophy level at the company is that we want to learn from our mistakes and we want to share those mistakes. So if we, if we figure out um, that our new user registration process is not working correctly, it's something that we want to be very transparent with and tell our users that we're going to fix it and be up front with them and also share that with the rest of the community. I would say that's one thing that um, I really enjoy about the Bay Area, about being around San Francisco, is that because there are so many startups and there's kind of a startup culture, uh, people are very, very willing to share with each other. Even though you might be competitors, you talk about the challenges that you're facing uh, with each other, which I think is, is pretty unique. And the other thing that we want to do is we want to build ideas that could potentially change the world. So we're going after big, bold new ideas, not just kind of rehashing old ideas. So we won't tackle it or we won't develop it unless we think it's something new and in a different direction than we've seen done before. Some of the common mistakes that I see, I meet with a lot of startups and, and, I, and I talk to new entrepreneurs and people that are getting off the ground for the first time. And one of the things that I hear a lot of is people say, I'm going to build the next Facebook. And I think this is the wrong approach because I, I feel as though um, the, the entrepreneur that starts the, the project for the first time, like the person that actually invented the technology, they're the one that's going to be most passionate about that technology. And so, I, I, you know, oftentimes I will see a lot of clone-like sites, and they just keep following the leader. And I, I feel as though that may work sometimes, but it's not necessarily, there's not a lot of innovation going on there because it's just uh, copying what someone else is doing. And I think that the most interesting projects, at least for me personally, are the ones that are trying something new and something uh, distinct. I also hear things like, we're going to build Twitter for, for cats, which is just weird things like that, where people will say, well, it's a slight different variation of that. Um, or I think this will make me rich. That's another one that I hear a lot of. Like People think that, well, if I build this idea, I'm going to make a lot of money doing it. And, and one of the things that I, I will say is um, the projects that we like to take on, and especially with Dig, when I launched Dig a few years ago, I remember thinking, well, eventually, if this will pay for my rent to live in, in my room and I can work out of my house and, and, and work on this project, um, I'll be happy because it was something I was really, truly, personally passionate about. So it really didn't matter how big it, it grew, and I was really shocked to see it take off the way it did. But, um, you know, it, it never felt like work. Yeah, it wasn't like I ever woke up in the morning and said, like, oh, I have to go back to work at this. And, it was just something I, I, I really, truly loved. And so it just came naturally to want to pursue that. And so for us also, I feel as though we're working on projects that, that really um, we're excited and, and passionate to be working on. So I've done a bunch of mobile investments over the last few years. Um, here's a handful of the companies uh, that I've invested in that, that do mobile. And I feel as though one of the things that I look for as an investor is I'm looking for new distinct ideas that I spoke about earlier. And so I'll give you a few of those examples. So Chomp is a service that they were launched around the premise of uh, search for the App Store. So Apple, um, if you've played around with their search engine, um, they're not uh, naturally a search company. And so they had a, a, a problem with search relevance and returning the right types of applications when you type in certain queries. And so they said, well, you know, no one's really doing this well. Even Google's having a problem with their Android search. We're going to go out there and solve search for mobile applications because it's different than web-based um, <clears throat> websites where you can actually crawl that content. And they built a mobile experience around that. <clears throat> Batch was an example of uh, a company saying, you have all these pictures that you take on your iPhone, and oftentimes you'll be out taking multiple photos of different things, but you never share them. They just sit on your phone and they're never shared anywhere. How can we create a private area for you to be able to take the collection of photos and share those with close personal friends? You know, Foursquare was an example of people wanting to say, where are my friends? I don't know where they are. I'd like to potentially meet up with them. You know, how can I check in to these places and tell someone I'm here at this conference and maybe they'll see that they're only a couple blocks away and come meet up with me. So these are a bunch of different examples of, um, of just uh, people doing things differently in the mobile space and why they were interesting in investments. A couple other ones that I like, Square. Jack Dorsey is, of course, a brilliant guy. He was one of the co-founders of Twitter. Uh, his new project, Square, really enabled a whole other level of mobile payments to, to occur um, at a variety of different places. Uh, Square 
the, the reason I really like Square is it was such out of the box thinking. It was so different to say, I'm going to take uh, a component of the iPhone, a piece of the hardware that is the audio input into the iPhone and make it so that when you swipe the card, it converts that to audio and then listens to it through the microphone jack and then turns that into the actual number um, on, the, on the phone. So it was figuring out how to take an actual hardware piece of the, the phone and use, use that device to, to translate credit cards. It was just a, a brilliant idea at the time and has taken off like crazy for, for mobile payments. Um, this is an industry that I think is really going to explode in the next few years that is uh, just starting to take off now. This is the Nike fuel band. And this is um, this idea of being able to, to uh, the, the quantified self, like the idea of being able to track um, your personal activity and how much exercise that you perform and have that sync back to a mobile device is, is just getting off the ground. Um, Jawbone has a similar device out there called the Up. Uh, I also have another device that, that um, I wear on me called the Fitbit and it tracks your steps, it tracks how many stairs that you climb, it tracks how many miles that you've walked, um, how many calories you've burned. And I think that um, the idea that you could quickly glance down at your wrist and know how active you are for the day, or and it also tracks your sleep activity. Um, and then being able to translate that into charts and graphs on the mobile device and share it with your friends when you hit certain milestones, I think is really unique. Being able to say that, you know, set goals for you and your friends and say, okay, we're going to walk 10,000 steps a day and then have that spread and, and have it be a competition, I think is a lot of fun. So this device um, is going to be shipping later this month, and I think this is a, a really interesting space to watch. Also, um, you know, looking forward to other things like the Apple television coming out later this year, um, you know, and how a mobile device can communicate with that television over Bluetooth or over Wi-Fi and can then act as a separate control controller to control games on the Apple TV. I mean, there's just going to be a lot of, uh, of new ideas and, and new innovations coming out of, of uh, mobile devices talking to other devices. We're already starting to see that work on, on, the, um, on the iPad with using your, your phone as controllers to control the iPad. So um, one of the things that I really enjoy doing with entrepreneurs is brainstorming new ideas. And so we get together for, for uh, oh, I'm fine. Thank you, Aston Warner. Um, we get together for um, tea, and we'll sit down, and we'll talk about um, how can we come up with new ideas? What, what are, what are uh, new things that are exciting and, and cool? And so th this is how we spend a lot of our time. Uh, these are my uh, kind of three favorite, favorite ways to brainstorm new ideas. Um, one of the things I like to do is I, I like to catalog my day. And what I mean by that is I take down, you know, you can take down on a sheet of paper and you can write down every single thing that you do throughout the day and what potential pain points there are and where you can potentially build a new product or service to, to help with those pain points. So uh, an example of that is that, you know, I'll say, okay, I woke up in the morning. Uh, how do I feel? Am I warm? Am I cold? Okay, I sit up. I'm, I brush my teeth. Uh, the toothbrush, do I have a, do I have a toothbrush? Yeah, I have an electric toothbrush, and I, I think about every little step of the day, and you think about, is there any personal struggles that you're experiencing throughout your day that can be solved with technology? And so it's just like thinking and cataloging hundreds of things that you do throughout the day can help, help you potentially brainstorm new ideas and new products. Um, uh, also, looking to dis disrupt old industries. I'll give you an example of a new service that's launched about uh, a year and a half ago in San Francisco that is really taking off. Um, one of the things that's really difficult in San Francisco right now is ordering a cab to come and pick you up and, and drive you around. Um, they have a limited number of cabs that they give licenses to in San Francisco. And so it's really hard to flag down a cab. And sometimes you'll call them on the phone and say, you know, I need to take a taxi across town. And they, the taxi just won't show up. They, they, they just, the service is not the best. Um, what happened is uh, uh, this, uh, this guy, uh, Travis, he came up with an idea of they have all these, these um, rented cars, these like uh, nicer luxury cars, like the black cars that you can pay and they're only available, uh, they were currently only available to rent them out by the day. But the nice thing about taxis is you get into a taxi, you know, you pay them a fare and they drop you off and you're done. You don't have to keep in a, ca a car for the entire day. So he was able to go out and say, I'm going to give all of these nicer uh, black cars an iPhone. 
And in the iPhone, they will have the ability to say, I'm available for, for some, to pick up someone. And then I can take my iPhone out at any time in San Francisco, and I can say, I need a taxi right now. I can push a button. It will know where my GPS is and know where my coordinates are. And it will send a black car service will pull up in front of, in front of the house in just a couple minutes. I can then get in the car and get dropped off. Well, this really upset the taxi industry because they had a complete, um, they, 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 had the, they had the exclusive rights to have all the taxis in, in the Bay Area and they weren't issuing any new taxis and so they were kind of getting disrupted in a way by a different car service, but they weren't taxis, they were different. So it was really a way of saying, how can I use technology to solve a problem and, and, and provide a better service, a service that is on demand, so I push a button and it instantly happens. Um, you don't have to pay, the, 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 the fee is already calculated into your phone, and so you don't have to pull out any currency of any type, it just automatically happens. You get in the car and you get out, and it just, it, it really exploded. And now, you know, they have dozens of cars, they've launched all, uh, in several cities in the world now, and it's really starting to take off. So that was a, an example of someone saying, well, I have a problem, I can't get a taxi. How many other people are having this problem, and how can we solve this problem with technology? Uh, it was a great example of that. Um, and the last thing I do is I like to look towards the future and think about devices and where they're going and, and where we'll be you know, five and 10 years from now. And one of the things that is, um, I've noticed in the last few years is I, I have a niece, and she is um, seven years old now. And uh, she uh, was lucky and got an iPad um, for the holidays here uh, about a year ago. <clears throat> and one of the things that I noticed is that she doesn't use the computer. She only uses the iPad. And she is so fast on the iPad, much faster than I am, it's kind of scary. And one of the things that um, I started thinking about was this is her main device to input data uh, and to surf the web and to launch applications. And she doesn't want to ever use a laptop. She doesn't like the keyboard on the laptop. She doesn't like these things. And it's, it's kind of, um, I, I thought to myself, it, it worries me that maybe in five, 10 years from now, I'm going to be that old guy that uses the laptop and all the young kids will just be using the iPads and all these touch devices. And so, you know, what type of technologies and how does that change what we develop for the future? Um, how, the, the, the data input obviously changes. The front-facing camera, all the accelerometer and other hardware that's in the device changes. You know, how will application change and get smarter on that device uh, versus the iPad? And, and maybe we should consider focusing our development efforts on these future devices. So those are some of the things that, that I, I like to brainstorm ideas around with, with other entrepreneurs. Um, one of the things I want to do is leave some time for some questions, uh, do some Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions at all, I, I'd love to, to take them and, and chat with you and hopefully uh, answer them.